Hey everyone, so today we're going to take an opportunity and explore the Torah's top tips for a sense of well-being. And the truth of the matter is that in life, a lot of times we think that we're looking for this nebulous concept called happiness, and what we're really looking for is a sense of well-being, a certain continuing uh, existing feeling that things are good, that there's a balance in our life, that we are gracious, that we have gratitude for the things that we have in our life. And um, th this is really the ultimate goal of what we are, uh, what, we're, what is driving us uh, throughout the course of our life. As it says in the Declaration of Independence that each one of us uh, was granted by God uh, unalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness that we are trying to achieve ultimately is this overall sense of well-being. Happiness uh, in the truest form, in the simcha form, means that we, are, we have an overall sense of well-being. And the truth of the matter is, if we think about it, uh, we don't even need to get at that much thought, we sort of owe it to ourselves to, to have a sense of well-being. We owe it to ourselves to be happy. It's not just a good idea. Uh, it, we should look at it as almost a moral obligation. Right? If, if we think about it just for a moment, this becomes a very obvious sort of thing. We owe it to our husband or our wife, our, our fellow workers, our children, our friends. We owe it really to everyone who comes into our life to be happy, as happy as we can be, right? This doesn't mean acting unreal and certainly doesn't mean uh, refraining from any sort of honest or intimate expressions with those that are closest to us, uh, but what we owe it to, uh, to others, uh, we owe it to ourselves, we, um, to, to work on our happiness. We, we don't enjoy being around others who are usually unhappy. Those people um, who enter our lives, those who enter our lives feel a similar way. Ask any child what it's like to grow up with unhappy parents, or ask any parent what they what causes them the most pain and suffering. It's an unhappy child. So a sense of well-being is something that is not only a good thing to have, it's something that we should feel an obligation to strive for. And this is this is very much based on a on a fundamental premise in Torah, which is expressed in the Psalms. It says in Psalm 100, verse 2, Ivdu es Hashem besimcha, serve God with joy, that you should seek to ha serve God with joy, which means ultimately having a sense of well-being. This, this is not the uh, get happy quick uh, phenomena that you, that you see sometimes, uh, touted in our society, that you just read this book or take this course and all of a sudden you're going to be happy. No, it's, it's a, it, is a, it can be a long process. It can be a very uh, di a difficult project. A, 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 um, you know, it's, we're, we should consider ourselves a work in progress when it comes to this, but uh, at the end of the day, it is something certainly worth striving for. And the, and the, very, the very first premise of establishing a sense of well-being, a sense of security, a sense of happiness inside of oneself begins with uh, humility. Uh, humility and gratitude very much go together. Uh, a person who feels that they deserve things, that, 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 uh, that they, well, they never feel that they should be uh, in gratitude because I, everything that I have, I deserve, and, I, and if I deserve it because I earned it and I did, it's all about me, and I deserve, then I can't have gratitude to God. I can't have gratitude to others who were helpful in me uh, accomplishing this. And if I can't have gratitude, I can't, I can't be happy. Right? I'll, never, I'll never truly be happy. But a person who has gratitude has, has happiness. And so the spiritual pursuit, one of the things that come naturally with having a spiritual pursuit uh, you know that a person is truly on a spiritual pursuit and that they're, spir they're, they're truly advancing on their spiritual pursuit is if they become more humble. If a person, through their study and through their work in, their spir in the spiritual realm, they become less humble, well, something's not right. Something is not going the way that it needs to be going on a person's spiritual journey. The uh, adding more spirit to one's life 
adding more spirituality to one's life by default means that you thinking less of your own involvement. You, you put God in the picture more. You begin to sort of disappear. You are become more of a vessel, more of a conduit towards the expression of godliness in the world as opposed to thinking, I deserve and I am entitled. Uh, and some of the thoughts that come to people. And then one of the ways in which we see this clearly, uh, one of the analogies that I like to use is if you put a small mirror up to your nose and exhale through your nose, is, you know, it's interesting that in the, in the Bible text, the, the soul, God, it says, breathe the breath of life into Adam. And so the soul, the neshama, is, is related to the idea of breath. And so when, you're, when you exhale through your nose onto this small mirror, it fogs up the mirror. The more you exhale, the more the breath comes out, the more the, the air comes out, the more that you begin to fade away because it fogs up on the mirror. And this, this is how it goes. The more spirit in your life, the more uh, divinity in your life, the more soul in your life, the less you mm -hmm. begin to see of yourself and give credence to yourself and you maintain a humble overall spirit, right? The more you acknowledge that you are a conduit towards expressing what God wants in the world rather than I deserve and I earned and it's all about me. Okay, so there is this happiness phenomenon that is going on. It's been growing over the last I would say 20 years or so. In the year 2000, there were 50 books on the topic of happiness that were published. And by 2008, that number had reached 4,000 books that were just published that year. And the numbers keep going up and up and up. And you see uh, all around in our society this sort of happiness kick and how to get happy and all sorts of different methods and how to achieve happiness are are very much in vogue. The most popular class at Harvard University is about positive psychology. And at least a hundred other universities offer similar courses as well. Now there's nothing wrong with trying to be happy. Obviously we're saying that that a key in life is to is to explore a sense of happiness and explore a sense of well-being and try to achieve that. We said it's a moral obligation that we have to, to be happy. But um, the methods that are being used a lot of times today are, are sometimes counterproductive. There's a new generation of psychologists that builds up a respectable body of research on positive character traits and happiness-boosting practices. And at the same time, uh, there's developments in neuroscience that have provided new clues to what makes us happy and what happiness actually looks like in the brain. So there are, there are certain things that have come out that are helpful in actually measuring in a quantifiable way what happiness, what well-being is all about. Now, according to some measures, as a nation... Interestingly enough, as the happiness fad has grown in the last 20 years, right, the, all these self-help and life coaches and, and courses and, and, again, all, all good things, all good ideas and, and, and whatnot. But it's interesting that as a nation, since the fad has kicked in, we've grown sadder and more anxious during the time of the, these same years, these same years where happiness has become a focus, right, that the happiness movement has been flourishing, we've become sadder as a, as a nation. And so perhaps this is why we've eagerly, you know, bought up to the, to the offerings, all of the books and all of the courses and all... This this may be exactly why it might be, it may be that college students sign up for positive psychology lessons in droves because a full fifteen percent of them report being clinically depressed. Okay, so there there are those who see in the whole happiness brigade they see it almost as a facade that there's something very empty, something lacking over here. So in other words, it comes from a good place, but there might be something in the method of how to get it that might be lacking. And so young people who are... Uh, one, one, one of the things that, that is observed in, in those that view the whole happiness uh, movement as a facade is that they observe that our preoccupation with happiness has come at the cost of sadness 
right? Sadness is an important feeling that we've, try, that we've actually tried to banish from our emotional repertoire. And so it's important that on the whole happiness kick, we don't negate the expression or the experiencing of other feelings as well. There's, there's a certain lamentable point that young people are naturally, let's say, sad, right? Weepy over breakups. And, they're all, and one of the unfortunate results is that they're often urged to medicate themselves right away instead of working through their sadness. Now, the, the whole idea of uh, there's, there's nothing wrong, per se, with the concept of medication, but it could be that in certain parts of our society that there's an overemphasis, that, that, should be, that that's the, the, the first route, that's the first approach, you know, without, without trying uh, certain other things that may be more, may be more uh, worthwhile for the person in the long run. Um, so a lot, of medic a lot of young people are, are being prescribed medication to sort of become happy right away, and not, instead of dealing with the feelings, instead of experiencing those feelings and growing through those feelings of what this sadness is like and how it feels and, and how to uh, get through it. And so our obsession with happiness sometimes, right, focusing on this concept, on this nebulous topic of happiness, focusing on that, our obsession with happiness amounts to a craven disregard for the melancholic expect, uh, perspective that, that uh, has given rise to some of our greatest works of art. Right? The, the, the happy man, in some extent, to some, to some degree, is a hollow man. The happy man that, that people are shooting for today, uh, that people are running after today, that focuses only on happiness and gets rid of the whole spectrum of other emotional experiences that a person can have, it can be detrimental because it makes us into sort of like a one-dimensional figure, one-dimensional um, existence. And a human being is a multifaceted, multi-planed individual that we need to sort of um, cultivate in all areas, ultimately, hopefully, leading to a sense of well-being and happiness, but not to only focus and to ignore and disregard other emotional experiences that take place in our life. Both the happiness and the anti-happiness forces that are, you know, in the in in the, in vogue right now, right? The, the, the forces of happiness that are that are saying that to to get on the, the happiness bandwagon and to negate all the other feelings, and then there's the the anti-happiness group that is that is saying don't ignore uh, some of the other experiences actually do agree on something important that we Americans especially tend to grab superficial quick fixes such as extravagant purchases or fatty foods uh, to subdue any sort of negative feeling um, and, and to, we, we tend to go to the quick fixes to subdue any negative feelings that, that come upon us. These measures seem to hinge on a belief that constant happiness is somehow our birthright. We deserve it. That the, we, we must always have a, an, a feeling of happiness 24-7. Right? A, a body of research shows that instant indulgences do calm us down for a few minutes, but they also leave us poor. They also leave us sometimes physically less healthy. Um, they also, we, we wind up generally more miserable in the long run and, and also lacking the real skills to get us out of the rut. So all these quick fixes, whether it's something physical that we run to or a quick fix course that's going to make me happy or quick fix method, one of the first things that people ask me as a, as a rabbi or as a life coach or as a chaplain uh, in, in many areas of, of counseling uh, that uh, that I've had the experience and the pleasure to help people with, one of the one of the first things that people ask is any quick advice. Yeah, yeah, sure, quick advice. I mean, any quick advice on how to be happier? Well, I mean, yeah, that's kind of what we're we're talking about now is some some useful tips and whatnot. But uh, the tips I can give, but. If this is uh, this is something that needs to be worked on. This is something that you can't expect to just snap into existence. It may take two minutes to share some of the to share some of the tips, but 
the the actual implementation of that is a, is an ongoing process. You know, just because you uh, ha have a cookbook doesn't mean that you're you, that you, it doesn't mean you have dinner on the table, right? It, you could buy the cookbook, you can know the recipe, but you gotta you gotta make it happen. You gotta do it yourself. Just because you own a gym membership doesn't uh, doesn't make you uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, it's 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 a work in progress. So the first step, yes, is is getting the gym membership or whatever. But you you gotta work it. You gotta you gotta do it yourself. And uh, it's an ongoing process. It's a it's a continual process that we shouldn't just say, oh, any quick advice on how to be happy? Yeah, as if I could just snap my fingers and change your life. You know, uh, we can we can talk about the tools, and we can talk about the recipes, and we can talk about the um, the workout model, but it's up to an individual to make it an ongoing um, part of their life to to seek happiness, to seek a sense of well-being, and to maintain that balance. So happiness isn't all about smiling all the time. It's it, right. It's not about that at all. It's it's all about it, it's it's not about eliminating bad moods. It, so the the question of what is happiness, what is the sense of well-being? So the most useful definition that we can work with, that's agreed upon by neuroscientists, psychiatrists, behavioral e e uh, economists, by uh, positive psychologists, by Buddhist monks, is is more like a sense of satisfaction that uh, or content than it is. The, what you what you think of as happy, right? It's it's a it's a a deep sense of satisfaction, a deep sense of content. That is ultimately what we're looking for, not a, a series of hap, ha, quote unquote happy experiences and the feeling where we can't wipe that smile off our face. That's not what we're after, and that's not a realistic view of what we should be shooting for. So it, the it it has depth, it has deliberation to it. It encompasses living a meaningful life, utilizing your gifts and your time, living with thought and with purpose. These are the makings of the person with well-being, who has a good sense of well-being, who has balance in their life. It's maximized when you feel that you're a part of a community, when you confront annoyances and crises in your life with grace. It involves a willingness to learn and to stretch and to grow, which sometimes involves discomfort. You may not have a smile on your face all throughout that time. It requires acting on life, not merely taking it in. It's not joy, a temporary exhilaration, right, or even a pleasure that we're think that we're looking for, right? Th right. Though a steady supply of those things does come in course with those who seize each day. You will have moments of pleasure. You will have moments of exhilaration. But it, the goal is not to live with a constant sense of pleasure and exhilaration. The goal is to have a sense of well-being, which means that a person has a sustained sense of being, feeling satisfied and content uh, through maneuvering uh, the course of life. Now, it's... it's um, there, there's, there's been real progress with uh, understanding happiness and how to, how to achieve it. Now, here, here are some of the greatest hints that are, um, I would say, useful tips that I hope everyone can use in their own life on how to achieve a sense of well-being, how to hit that, that point of perpetual happiness, satisfaction, contentment in life. The, the, the greatest tips... Um, would 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 uh, would be as follows. Okay, so firstly, before we get into the tips, it, it is important to recognize that there are some people who are born happier. Right? These these lucky people really are born with brighter outlooks than others. They they simply see beauty and opportunity where others would hone in on flaws and dangers. Okay, so it is important to know that some people are sort of pre-wired for a sense of well-being or a sense of happiness in a greater extent than others. But, but those with, who have the more ominous orientation can also alter their outlook, uh, at least to a point. Okay, we, we, No one should say, well, I wasn't born happy or I wasn't born with a sense of positivity. I, I can't change it. Well, you, you can. You can tweak it. There, 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 we can 
help those people to to uh, to learn internally to challenge their feel their fearful thoughts or their negative thoughts of what outsiders might think right those thoughts that uh, that person thinks I'm an idiot or I'm going to get fired those thoughts that sort of uh, we, that we tell ourselves if we are negative minded people naturally uh, I'm never going to be a good parent all, all of these negative thoughts that that stick at the back burner of our mind that are sort of constantly haunting the person who has a predisposition to negativity, uh, there, there are ways in which you can battle with or, or uh, cope with the, the incessant negative thoughts that where your mind kind of goes initially. So engaging in positive internal dialogue is actually a mark of someone who's mentally healthy. So there are ways, and a person should explore the ways, of talking to one's self about the reality of these negative thoughts that you might have. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, another tip for the quest for well-being, getting what you want doesn't bring lasting happiness. You think that happiness is going to arrive if you're going to win the lottery or if you would, or, or would forever, uh, your happiness would be lost forever if you lost your house uh, in a flood. Okay, so we think that happiness, if, if I just won the lottery, I would be happy forever. Or, or if something terrible happened, like I lost my house from a flood, then my happiness would be gone forever. But the human being is interesting in that the human being is remarkably adaptable. After a variable period of adjustment, we, we tend to bounce back to a previous level of happiness, no matter what happens to us. It's an interesting thing, which, which kind of highlights some of the things that we were talking about last week. Last week we said, the quote from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, that there is no such thing as despair, because as long as Hashem, as long as God is in my life, I can never give up hope. And as long as there's hope, I can move towards a sense of well-being. I can move towards a sense of happiness, right? A person should never, ever think that there is no hope because God is with us. There's always hope. There's always hope. And so if that's the case, um, I, I also have to know that even when I'm going through a very challenging time or challenging situation, that, that we will prevail, we will uh, adapt to whatever challenge has been thrown our way and make the best of it, and that we will return to a sense of well-being, a, a sense of happiness that we felt before. Our adaptability, interestingly enough, this this feel, this ability that a human being has to adapt to the good and to the bad, it works in in two directions, right? Because we're so adaptable, we we quickly also get used to the accomplishments that we strive for in life. So, in other words, it's it's a good it's a good coping tool when to be able to adapt to, to challenges. That if I if I'm undergoing a challenge in the in the for the time being. Okay, so we have pre-programmed that we adapt fairly quickly to challenges that we're faced with. But it also works even in the realm of positive things. We quickly get used to many of the accomplishments that we've striven for in life, right? When we, when we land that big job or we got married or all of these sort of big accomplishments that we uh, think that we're shooting after and think that are going to make us happy forever and that's going to be everything's going to be perfect then soon after we reach that milestone we start to feel that something is missing we begin coveting another worldly possession or eyeing another social advancement but such an approach keeps us tethered on what we talked about last week called the hedonic treadmill where happiness is always just out of reach. If I'll just have X, I'll be happy. That one last toy, that one last experience, just one notch away. It's possible to get off the treadmill entirely by focusing on activities that are dynamic, that are surprising, that are attention-absorbing, and thus less likely to bore, uh, to bore us than, say, something shiny. A new, a new toy that we got, right? The new car. Wow, I got a new car. Ooh, I'm getting a new television in two weeks, right? It's coming in the mail. You know, the, these are things that, that we will get used to so quickly and will not provide us any sense of real well-being. Real well-being is in the struggle, is in the, is in the, the work towards something that is meaningful. 
It is in the, it is in the strife. It is in the, the toil. Pain is a part of happiness. This is the next sort of tip uh, of, of things to know in the, in, the, in the search and in the quest for well-being. Pain is a part of the happiness. Pain, uh, you know, happiness is not your reward for escaping pain. Right? You've figured out a way to escape pain, therefore you're rewarded with this sense of happiness. It demands that you confront negative feelings. Right? Happiness demands that you confront your negative feelings head on without letting them overwhelm you. To be able to cope with them, to be able to deal with them, to be able to wrestle with them. Popular conceptions of happiness are kind of dangerous because they set people up for a sort of a struggle against reality. They don't acknowledge that real life is actually full of disappointments, of loss, of inconveniences. If you're going to live a rich and meaningful life, you're going to feel a full range of emotions. That's the way life goes. And so, you know, and, that, and that's, you can look at an EKG, right? What is a sign of life? Well, ups and downs, right? There's, a, there's dynamic over there. A stagnant, constant existence, right? What does that tell you on the EKG? That's not a real life. That's, that's the opposite of life. And so with life, and with an overall sense, even with an overall sense of well-being, there are ups and downs. There is a reality that things are going to happen that are going to be challenging for you in your life. That's 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 that is the reality. That, and we have to we have to be able to recognize that. But it's our ability to confront those things, to deal with those things, to move past those things that ultimately get us to a true sense of well-being. If you want to be, we don't want to be flat, one-dimensional people. Being having a full, rich, meaningful life means uh, grappling with parts of yourself that you don't like. It means undergoing experiences that you're not going to like. But part of that, like they say, oh, if it doesn't if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Well, I mean that's that's kind of like a a I don't want to use a cliche, but that but that is. There is something to that, that part of the dynamic of what makes us human and what makes us a human being that is multidimensional and has, has depth to us is our ability to undergo experiences that certainly in the time were not pleasant experience, but that they certainly bring out aspects of ourselves that, that we can now understand better, that we can now utilize for positive purposes. And this does overall uh, help with our lasting sense of well-being. The point isn't to limit the palette of our feelings. After all, negative states that we go through can cue us into what we value and what we need to change. So, for example, grief for a loved one proves how much we cherish our relationships. So grief is not a, is not a fun experience, but at, all, at the same time, it kind of gives you a perspective on how much that person meant to you. It is a, it is a tool that can be utilized and, and, and framed in, a, in, a sen, in, a, in the sense of well-being. Okay, so grief for a loved one does prove how much we cherish our relationships. Frustration with, with several jobs in a row is a sign that maybe you're in the wrong career. Okay, and so, so all of these things, there's, there, there is a, an exploration, and, and we get to the depth of the person, the sense of well-being that we want to achieve, comes about through going through all sorts of different experiences. Happiness would be meaningless without sadness. Sometimes it's the contrast. In fact, the Torah tradition teaches that God ultimately created the world in order to bestow good upon humanity. God wanted to, that some other entity should be able to experience the ultimate good, which is godliness, which is himself. Which is, and so to create these other entities, these other beings that perceive themselves to be something separate, and to be able that, that they should be able to experience the greatness and full grandeur of God, right? He wants to give, he, God wants to give, the, the essence of God and his goodness is to bestow his goodness, is to want to give goodness to another. And so God creates this other entity, for lack of a better term, human beings, and wants them to experience the full gamut of what 
the the of of God to 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 to, to have the actual most meaningful and uh, palpable experience of God, and so how does he do that? Well, first of all, he does it in a way that we have to earn things, right? He doesn't just give it to us because embedded in us is that we appreciate things more when we've earned them, when we've worked towards them. He right? doesn't just shower us with divine blessing. It's it's there's commandments involved, and there's reward and punishment involved. But one of the things that that is said also is he doesn't just send us to or let us reside in the heavens, right? The, the ultimate experience of godliness, the ultimate experience of God's good comes about through putting us in a place where it seems that God is concealed. Because you don't recognize light unless there's darkness to contrast it with. If you put on a flashlight in broad daylight, you can't even see the light. But as the sun goes down and as it begins to get darker outside, that light, which hasn't changed, that flashlight, which hasn't changed, just been left on all day, all of a sudden seems to be getting brighter because now it's being contrasted with something else. And so our experience of God ultimately is going to be enhanced by being put in a world where it seems that we are devoid of God. The ult- God wanted us to have the ultimate, ultimate experience of him. The ultimate experience of himself. And in order to do that in a proper way, in a meaningful way, in a way that we will be able to tangibly experience that in the greatest sense, is by putting us in a situation where God seems to be concealed and God seems to not exist even. Because we have to know, and a key message for life, is that without the contrast of darkness, there is no light. And so we have to have a multitude of experiences and a whole emotional spectrum in order to really experience what happiness is and what a sense of well-being is. Another way in which a person experiences a sense of well-being is through mindfulness. Mindfulness is a mental state of relaxed awareness in the present moment that's marked by an openness and curiosity towards your feelings rather than judgments of them. And it's a powerful tool for experiencing happiness when it's practiced regularly. Okay, uh, happiness also we should know is not an end destination. Happiness lies in the chase itself, actions towards goals other than happiness. Right, when we're not shooting for happiness, right, those are the things that make us happy. There is a place certainly for vegging out on the couch and watching your favorite soap opera or whatever it is. Th- those are those easy pleasures that that the person gets will never light us up. In the same way that mastering a new skill will, that building something from scratch will, it's in the pursuit, it is in the the actions towards the goals that bring happiness and bring a sense of well-being to our life. And it's not crossing the finish line. Right? It's not once we actually get to the end of where we're trying to achieve, right, that that's the most rewarding. It's anticipating the the achieving of your goal. That working hard towards the goal and making progress to the point of expecting the goal to be realized doesn't just activate positive feelings, it also suppresses negative feelings like fear and depression. So um, another thing to be aware of is that uh, studies show that money does uh, only helps with happiness in the sense that Only when you get to the extent that you can cover your expenses, that you can live comfortably, that you're not necessarily worried about where you're going to get your next meal from. But once you've achieved a a a status, or once you've achieved a level where your your basic bills and basic needs are met, more money doesn't really add significant happiness. This is what every study that's been done on the topic seems to imply. Um, Happiness also is relative. Another key tip uh, in assessing one's happiness and assessing one's sense of well-being. Uh, so this whole idea of like keeping up with the Joneses, there's a nagging thought that people have. Many people struggle with this. It's known as status anxiety, right? The whole keeping up with the Joneses idea. In effect, it, it does affect how happy we are and how our overall sense of well-being we can perce- you know we perceive. Because some you know, and some people are more obsessed than others. Uh, but we're all sort of attuned to how we're doing in life relative to those around us. And to stop uh, status worries from gnawing at your happiness, you, you should choose your peer group and you should choose you know, who you associate with um, very carefully. 
Uh, so owning the smallest mansion in a gated community might actually might make you feel worse off than buying the biggest bungalow in a less affluent neighborhood. So again, everything, we're not saying that you should purposely uh, surround yourself with people that you smell, feel, feel uh, smarter than and wealthier than and better looking than. We're not saying that, <laughs> we're not saying that, that's, the, that that's the idea, but at the same time, uh, for, for many people that, who actually struggle with this immensely, and they have very much to keep by keeping up with the Jones mentality, we have to be careful about how we, because if you compare, if you're, if you're, if your challenge is overly comparing yourself to others, you need to really play, pay extra attention on who the others that you are uh, surrounding yourself with are, because that will uh, contribute to your sense of well-being. It's interesting, another tip as well, another idea, is that options, this is uh, sort of a scientifically explored topic, and it seems that options, the more options that we have, the more miserable we become. We're constantly making decisions in life, whether it's small decisions about what we're going to have for dinner, whether it's a big decision of who we're going to marry, uh, or just the, the, the constant choices of what ice cream flavor we're going to have in the store. We base many of our decisions on whether we think a particular preference will increase our well-being. Right? Am I going to be happy? ultimately happy if I have this ice cream flavor or that ice cream flavor. If it's this tile or that tile, intuitively we seem convinced that the more choices that we have, the better off we're ultimately going to be. But the world of unlimited opportunity imprisons us actually more than, make, than makes us happy. <clears throat> Facing many possibilities kind of leaves us or can leave us stressed out and less satisfied. And, and uh, whatever we do, whatever we do decide, we're always kind of contrasting to what would it have been like if I had all those other opportunities, if what I would have explored, should I have gotten the strawberry ice cream? What if I would have had Rocky Road or whatever? You know, we, we, we compare it to all the other options that are out there. And sometimes the more options that are there, the more stressed out and anxious we become. So we have to sort of rewire our minds and thinking like that also that just, you know, pick one and enjoy it. And that's, that's the way it's going. You know, don't, don't focus so much, try not to focus so much on comparing it to, oh, what if I would have done it that way? And we just get stuck. One, one, one thing to, to recognize, and a very strong piece of, uh, of information, uh, certainly a Torah idea, is that the best advice to come out of any of the whole happiness brigade that, that is going on in the world is to the, the importance of making strong personal relationships, that you should make those your priority. Good relationships are buffers against all the damaging effects of life's inevitable letdowns, setbacks. Strong personal relationships is where it's at, and that's that should definitely be a focus on uh, in our in our lives. Um, you should do your happiness homework. You should do your well-being homework. You can increase positive feelings in your life by incorporating a few proven practices into your routine. So uh, perhaps write a, a gratitude letter towards someone every week. Uh, visualize the best possible future for yourself once a week. Uh, perform acts of kindness on a regular basis for people to lift your mood, uh, not only in the moment, but over the course of time. These are, these are tried and true methods that will overall enhance your sense of well-being. Uh, happiness also, you have to remember, we, we have to think not only in the here and now. Happiness hinges upon our time frame. And feeling happy while you carry out your day-to-day -day activities might not do so much, uh, might not have so much, how, your day-to-day -day activities may not, certainly in the short run, have anything to do with how satisfied you feel in general. Time actually skews our perceptions of happiness and um, can reframe our sense of well-being as well. So if you're a parent, you look back warmly on your children's preschool years, right? However, when studies have been conducted, child care tasks rank very low on the list of what makes a person happy, what makes people happy. It, it ranks below napping and TV watching, right? So in the short term, oh, yeah, I could see that. I'd, I'd rather be taking a nap or I'd rather be watching TV than, you know, dealing with the constant, uh, uh, the, co the constant struggle of child rearing. And yet, 
And yet, at the same time, if you were to step back and evaluate a decade of your life, would a spirited stretch of raising children or a steady stream of dozing off on the couch every day between soap operas, would that, which one would be uh, quantifiable to you or experienced by you looking back over the course of time as living, having lived a happier life, having a greater sense of well-being. So yeah, we have to evaluate our well-being in the macro as well as the micro level to get the most accurate picture of our sense of well-being. Okay, so just because a task is difficult or uh, tedious in in the in the in the time right now that we're going through it. In the long term, it certainly can be something that adds to a much greater sense of well-being and greater sense of happiness. You look back at your life and you feel the accomplishment much more in those things that maybe on a daily basis seem to be a terrible struggle, a very difficult, arduous task, work, daily working, whatever, whatever it is. But when you look back, there is a certain sense, a greater sense of well-being than had you not gone through those things and had you not had to deal with all the tediousness that, that accompanies that. Uh, the, the truth is many of us are, are wrong about what will make us happy and we're wrong about what made you happy in the past. There, there, things, are, things are almost never as bad or never as good as we expect them to be. Your promotion it can be quite nice, but it's not going to be a 24-hour parade. Uh, your breakup might be very hard, but it's also instructive and can even be energizing in some cases. We're terrible at predicting our future feelings accurately, especially if our predictions are based on our past experiences. The past exists in our memory, after all, and memory is, is not a reliable recording device. We recall beginnings and we recall endings much more intensely than we do in all of the long middles and whether they, those were eventful or not, right? So the, the horrible beginning of our vacation last year uh, will lead you astray in deciding the best place to go for next year. Some of the best ways uh, in, in sort of like a good takeaway to forego any of those mental projections, uh, whether you're going to enjoy something, is, is whether someone else enjoyed it, right? So if you, if you want to go to Mexico, or whatever, ask, ask your friend who went to Mexico if they enjoyed it, and then you can determine whether you would enjoy it rather than basing it on some of your past experiences because our, the way that we look back at things, for the better or for the worse, isn't always an accurate depiction and doesn't always give us a clear view of how to proceed in the future. Um, happiness also and well-being is embracing your natural coping style. Not everyone can put on a happy face, right? In fact, the whole idea of looking on the bright side isn't, po isn't possible for some people. It's a very difficult thing. We might, and may even be counterproductive to suggest, oh, look on the bright side. That might be counterproductive for some people. When you put pressure on people to cope in a way that doesn't fit them, it not only doesn't work, it makes them feel like a failure on top of already feeling bad. So the, the sort of one-size-fits-all approach to managing emotional life is misguided. And you know, there's there's a there was a book that was written uh, called like in the in the defense of pessimism, uh, or the power the, or the positive power of negative thinking, something something along those lines. And the the concept was that uh, sort of in, in defense of the idea of pessimism, pessimism, that anxious people uh, can can actually feel and harness their anxiety to make to help make things get done which in turn makes them happier in other words we feel greatest when we are accomplishing when we are in sync with our purpose in particular and that we're working towards those things and if your anxiety is gal is a galvanizing force at least to make you do things Right? That may actually be something that ultimately leads you to a sense of well-being. A naturally pessimistic architect, for example, uh, can set low expectations for an upcoming presentation and review all of the bad outcomes that, that, they're, that they're imagining are going to uh, come about so that they can prepare carefully and increase their chances of success. Right? So this is sort of the, uh, a positive outcome that can 
that can come from from this uh, negative mindset. So ultimately, and this is the this is the core of everything that we're going to say today. Ultimately, the greatest sense of well-being, the core of what it means to live a happy, balanced life full of true well-being, is living your values living them into the fullest extent. Now, if you aren't living according to your values, you won't be happy no matter how much you're achieving. You could accomplish all sorts of things, win all sorts of prizes and accolades. If it's not in sync with your values, it won't bring about happiness. Now, some people, however, uh, aren't even sure what these values are. They're not sure what their core values are that they're living with their core values. And if you're one of those people, imagine that I can wave a magic wand that would ensure that you have all of the approval and admiration of everyone on the planet, no matter what you do, forever. Right? We're going to wave that magic wand. Everyone is going to look at you in a way of approval and admiration from now on. Okay, so if I could wave that magic wand, and whatever you do, people are going to look at you in an admiring type of way. What would you choose to do with your life? This is, a, this is a, an interesting way of sort of looking, uh, being able to assess what it means living with your values. And once you've answered this question honestly, you can start taking steps towards the ideal vision and the ideal version of yourself. As long as you're living consciously and living with your values, the state of well-being, the state of happiness can be achieved by you, can be achieved by anybody who does that. And the state of happiness is not really a state at all, right? The state of happiness, the state of well-being is not really a state at all. It's an ongoing personal experiment. And it's something that all of us we owe it to ourselves to embark on. We owe it to those around us to embark on. It makes our life worth living. It, it empowers us to affect those around us. It is just the, it is the, the most fundamental core of life, the most important a avenue of everything, because it is the core of everything. A person who has a sense of well-being, who has a sense of purpose, can can live a life that is, again, we're not saying that it's going to be worry-free all the time. We're not saying that it's going to be challenge-free all the time, but that will all go into the pot of making you a multifaceted, multidimensional, dynamic human being who has a sense of well-being, who has a balanced sense of, of emotional um, expression, and will be able to affect the world around them. So I look forward to studying with you and, and, and learning with you uh, in the very near future. But for today, that concludes our lesson. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And uh, let's take the steps that we need to towards our greater sense of well-being. Take care.